Okay. Well, I hope somebody's on here. I can't really tell if you guys are or not today. Um, so today's uh, office hour number three, uh, October 9th, uh, 2014. And uh, I'm going to let Carlos introduce himself and, and tell you what his background is. You should have already seen his videos. And uh, we're going to talk about those and answer questions today. Carlos, please. So my name is Carlos Coimbra. I'm a professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering at uh, UC San Diego. Uh, and most of my research is related to solar forecasting. Uh, and solar integration. So this is uh, integration of uh, a variable renewable resource uh, into the grid. Uh, so we do, uh, you know, I have a large group, but like, you know, we, we work on uh, several issues related to that. Uh, it involves atmospheric physics, uh, it involves uh, uh, a lot of stochastic learning, machine learning, uh, putting all of these things together to try to understand how much uh, power is generated from uh, uh, both central and distributed solar plants. Okay, and we've got some questions that people have already sent in. Uh, so we're gonna look through some of those and answer them. And uh, there was a really simple one here that showed up. Just a second. And that was, I love this one because we're gonna start with a really simple one. How can I use solar energy at home? I'm gonna let Carlos answer that and then I'm gonna tell you what I'm doing about it. Uh, yeah, there are, there are many different technologies that you can use, uh, and some of them uh, would uh, pay off uh, almost immediately, uh, depending on where you live and, uh, and the price of the energy or the price of, uh, of the gas that you use to heat up your house or what, what mechanism you use to heat up your house. Uh, one thing that, uh, one technology that uh, pays off uh, almost immediately, uh, almost anywhere in the world, is uh, solar thermal heating, so using uh, solar energy to heat up. Uh, the water that you use at home, like for example, to take showers and so on. So that one is a, is a given. Uh, uh, I, I can remember from the mid 80s when a, a system, uh, a solar thermal heater would uh, probably take uh, four, five, six, seven years to pay the initial investment. Uh, that time has been reduced because of the increase in, in price in, uh, in gas and other forms of heating. Uh, to just a few months in some places and, uh, and not more than two years in, in the vast majority of the locations around the world. So that's one thing that you can do. Uh, so can, can I ask a question about that mm -hmm. one? So is, is that different than having photovoltaic on your roof that, it, that you're using to heat the water? This is a specific one where you're, you're pumping the water up and through the... Yes, that's, that's a heat exchanger basically. Okay. Like, so the, the old... Uh, design was just a tube and fin, like you, know, you have a black plate that absorbs the energy and pass that to the water. Mm -hmm. So the water can be, uh, in most cases, like you know, it's really you are literally taking uh, uh, a shower with the with the water that circulated through that heat exchanger. Okay, uh, that's one way. Like there are uh, uh, evacuated tubes now that are, are much uh, more efficient over uh, over cast days. Uh, and it's the same principle, like the water passes through the evacuated yep. tubes and uh, you heat up that and you, you use the, the hot water, typically coming out of the collectors at uh, from 75 uh, centigrade to, to 90 centigrade. Uh, so that's, that's different than using a PV panel and then right. using the electricity to heat up. That would be a very inefficient way of doing it. Okay, all right. So, I'm, so I was going to say, so I'm putting PV panels on my house um, sometime in the next month or two. So I bought, a, I bought an electric car. Uh, about a month ago, and that pushed my electric bill up high enough that I'm going to put those on. So what you're saying is I should get the PV uh, because that'll take care of the electricity in my house and charging my car, and then I have a separate system that I put on that heats the hot water. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. And and you know, and the, in your case, uh, the PV would would also make uh, perfect sense. Uh, one thing that you have to take, uh, to to watch out, and uh, you know, I'm obviously a very strong uh, advocate for solar energy, is you don't want to put PV on your roof and then cut the trees around it to make sure that uh, you are getting like the irradiance. So uh, it, this is really dependent on where you are, like uh, what yeah. your house is, and how much your power bill is. In your yeah. case, obviously, it pays off right away because of your electric car. Right. Yeah, and so actually, uh, at least here in San Diego now, um, so a guy came out, surveyed my roof, they look at it from Google, and uh, from that they can kind of measure the trees and then calculate where the shadows are going to be on the roof, and they found three or four places on my roof that work quite well. 
Um, but then I think now what they do is they're going to come out maybe next week and they actually put little monitors on there. Uh, and just to see, just to make sure there's no shadows from the trees or et cetera. So there's lots of different things you can use for solar energy at home. Um, some of them are kind of expensive. I will say that, that uh, it's not cheap to put. So I'm going to get a six kilowatt uh, system on my roof and that's about 26,000 um, bucks. Here in uh, the US, we get about 30% off of our taxes if we put one of those on. So my 26,000 bucks will cost me about 19,000, I think, out of pocket. And then that pays off by reducing my electricity bill. That will pay back uh, in about seven years, six and a half years, I think I get payback. Mm -hmm. And then the other nice thing you actually have for getting an electric car if you agree to charge it between midnight and 5 a.m., which I do, um, and you set your car to only charge at those times, then you get cheaper uh, electricity all, all day, 24-7. And uh, that that's apparently works out well for the utilities because they have very low uh, utilization from midnight to 6 a.m., and it helps them if people are actually using power at that time. Okay. All right. Um, let's go. Here's another one, and it says... Can we use solar thermal energy combined with other energy sources? For example, warm up water with solar energy, then evaporate it with natural gas if the solar energy is not enough to reach required temperature. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Uh, and uh, in fact, in the central plants, uh, one of the most efficient designs that you can have is to have uh, a, a dual cycle where you use the solar energy to uh, bring the vapor to a particular uh, temperature, like on a, a, a low temperature cycle, and you use natural gas like a tool, uh, in another turbine uh, to run a high temperature cycle. So the cycles are very different. Uh, if, you, if you do that, uh, you can connect the two, uh, the axle of the turbine. Like, this is one uh, easy way to think about it. So that uh, when the variability of the solar energy uh, is high, uh, you are actually supplementing that uh, with natural gas and you're producing uh, from almost uh, flat line uh, amount uh, to the grid. Uh, and the, the, the short answer to your question is yes. Uh, and uh, there are some designs that work like this. There are some power plants that work like this. I wish uh, more of the power plants were actually designed this way because these are very efficient way of uh, using both CSP, like the concentrated solar power, but also uh, to use the natural gas uh, that is available uh, and uh, so you are using the natural gas to enable a higher solar penetration is the best use of natural gas that you can have. All right, great. So do you know about the concentrating solar panels that are on the way between uh, here, San Diego and Las Vegas? Have you ever seen those? Me? Yeah. Yes, I work very closely with that power plant. Uh, that's uh, uh, Ivan Pass solar uh, power. So these are not uh, these are uh, heliostats, like they are mirrors that they <laughs> focus the power into uh, three different towers, like they are boilers on top of the towers. That power plant uh, itself can only use a very little amount of uh, natural gas by contract. Uh, they they can only use less than three percent of the power that they produce. Those guys? Yeah. 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 So we are we are we work very closely with them. Okay. So on those guys, when I drove by, so I drove out to Las Vegas uh, last two weeks ago. And when I drove by Friday afternoon, they were down. It was late in the evening. It's maybe 4 or 5 o'clock. And uh, the towers appeared to be jet black. Right? Yeah. yeah. And then when I drove by Sunday afternoon at 1 on the way back, they were glowing bright white. Now, is that because, the you know, that, that's just reflection coming off those? Or is that actually the temperature, the thermal excitation, and you're seeing the light come back out, you know? Yeah, so it, it's really like a combination of both. Like you know, the the boilers are black, like you know, at uh, room yep. temperature. But uh, when you reflect all the light there, uh, just by reflection, like you would have like you know, a very bright spot. So when they are fluxing, like you know, that's true. But the temperature there is not high enough to actually emit okay. the the white uh, uh, okay. color that you saw. Okay. But these are very bright spots. Like all three of them, like you know, when they are fluxing, mm -hmm. like on their their bright spots. Yes. Yeah. And then that is, uh, my understanding is those are heating up molten salt or something? No, How no do that, they that's again? only vapor. Okay. So that one has no storage. Like it's, uh, it's a power plant that runs okay. uh, vapor and, uh, and, and it has a very small thermal inertia because there's no thermal storage in that particular power plant. 
Okay, but but in other ones like that, I understand you could. Yes, exactly. You could. And that's one of the great advantages of uh, of CSP or the concentrated solar power is yeah. that the storage uh, component is cheaper, uh, and uh, it's even though it's working with salts and uh, molten salts, which are not easy materials to work with. Uh, in general, you you get uh, uh, a much better return for the the investment that you put in the money. Okay, and then where's the power from those going? That just goes under the grid, or, or is that specifically used for something? Are those experimental, or are they fully functional? No, they're fully functional. They're hooked up to the grid uh, okay. almost from uh, day one. Uh, they okay. sell. They have two towers uh, to one utility company in California. All, all the power comes to to utility companies in California. So two okay. towers are from one to one utility. The other tower is to another. Okay, and and somebody told me a rumor that Google owned one of those. Do you know anything about that? Who yeah. owns those? Yeah, uh, Google is a partner. Like the 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 whole power plant is uh, is owned by Solar Partners, which okay. is uh, uh, Google, NRG, and uh, Bright Source. Okay. Uh, and they enter with different components of it. Like, no one was uh, financing. The other one is the technology, and the other one actually manages the plant. Okay. All right. Great. They look totally cool, by the way. If anybody is ever a fantastic driving. engineering uh, yeah. project, yes. Yeah. I'll see if uh, I, I took some pictures with my iPhone as I was driving by. I'll see if I can, I'll get Travis to see if we can load them up so you guys can see them. Okay, here's one from someone down in Brazil. And they say, I live in Brazil, close to the equator, where it is basically summer all year long. I was there in November, I can vouch for that. It's summer all year long. In your opinion, what would be the potential of the application of photovoltaic or photothermal energy production here compared to what you have in San Diego, for instance? That's a good question. Okay, that's great. I'm from Brazil too, so I know the, the resource in Brazil very well. Uh, Brazil is uh, is blessed with a with a fantastic solar resource, uh, not in terms uh, of the only the intensity, but how uniform it is around you know around the territory and along the year. Uh, so the potential in Brazil for for uh, photovoltaics is uh, fantastic, uh, particularly uh, because uh, photovoltaics are not that strongly influenced uh, by uh, clouds as, as uh, uh, con concentrated solar power is. So of course, if you look at the whole territory of Brazil, like, um, there are places that are excellent for uh, concentrated technologies, and there are places that are excellent for uh, flat panels. Uh, I, I assume that you live in the north or the northeast, which is much closer to the equator. I, I know Brazil is only 16 degrees uh, south of the equator. Uh, so the the resource is excellent uh, in 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 the vast majority of the of the country. Ironically, I think where solar energy is uh, very well developed in Brazil is in the place where like there is the least amount of insulation, which is uh, by the coast of uh, Santa Catarina in the, in the south. Uh, but I I understand that uh, there are new changes in the way that the, the grid is managed and, uh, and the new laws coming up that would allow uh, for uh, a much larger penetration than what exists today. Yeah, and, and many of you will also know that Brazil is uh, now the number two producer of ethanol in the world. They produce theirs from sugarcane ethanol, and that's actually very profitable uh, in Brazil. And then they also have a fantastic uh, hydroelectric potential there. So Brazil kind of wins on many fronts <laughs> when it comes to renewable energy. That's one thing that you mentioned is very important. Like Brazil, uh, because of the very high uh, penetration of uh, hydropower into the uh, electric grid, uh, in fact, the ethanol contributes or used to contribute a few years ago uh, more to the uh, energy matrix than uh, the hydropower uh, because of all the, the cars, like you know, everybody mm -hmm. uses ethanol. Uh, but the hydropower gives this uh, fantastic inertia to the grid. Like, you know, it's almost like you have, uh, you know, 85% of a uh, nuclear in your in your uh, mm -hmm. uh, generation. So this allows you to have quite a lot of variability from solar without creating any problem in the grid. Uh, so we, from this perspective, uh, the fact that there is hydropower in Brazil, like, you know, it's a fantastic uh, asset in terms of uh, increasing the uh, or complementing the hydropower with the solar. Uh, because these are two uh, very complementary uh, uh, sources of energy. Yeah. Okay, here's one, and, and this will allow us to get into a, a couple of other uh, questions as well, which are also on our list for today. So what is the bottleneck issue with storing electrical energy in rechargeable batteries? But, but I want to put that as a, as a larger question, which is what is the challenge of storing energy, right? That, 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 that's really our challenge. 
whether it's it's solar because of the times it comes or the wind because it's intermittent or electric cars with our batteries. So if you could just in general comment on what some of the big challenges are and sort of evening out the grid and you know getting renewables to, to integrate. Uh, I'm not a battery uh, expert, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you my perspective. At this point, the, the storage of, you know, it's very difficult to store electrons, like, basically. So uh, batteries are very expensive. Uh, in many systems, like depending on the size of the system, the storage system would be as expensive as the whole power plant. Uh, so this uh, is prohibitive. Obviously, if you are trying to bring uh, solar and other source of uh, energy, renewable source of energy to grid parity, uh, if you have uh, uh, a, if you have to add on the storage that uh, would be uh, as expensive as the, the whole power plant, like you know, you are really increasing a lot the liberalized uh, cost of energy for that power plant. Uh, so the, the technical difficulties, I think there are many, many people working on on, on improving the, the reliability, the robustness, like on the life uh, time uh, uh, performance of our batteries and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem for me at this point uh, in terms of uh, electrical uh, storage or electrochemical storage is really uh, one of a cost only. We could do it now with the technology that exists, but like it's prohibited in terms of, our, of cost. Yeah, I know here at UCSD, we've talked about this before, that we got a bunch of the uh, used batteries from, uh, I think, BMW. And, uh, you know, that, that no longer have the capacity, uh, you know, for car use because their their storage capacity goes down over time with all batteries, right? But but those are, you know, stack them all together in a, in a I think we have them in a shipping container here someplace on campus, and then use that for short-term storage of uh, photovoltaic is, is worked pretty well. Okay, uh, you know, sort of upscaling, they call it. So here's one that's related, and, and, and I'm sure Carlos can answer this question. Why is thermal energy easier to be stored than solar power generated from panels? I think okay. you just answered that. Yeah, there, there's a physical reason for that. Uh, one of that is that uh, thermal energy is disorganized, so like, you know, you can, it's easier to, to just keep something at a higher temperature. Like the temperature is not very high uh, for thermal storage typically. So it's easier to, for example, if you use molten salt, like you know, you're just basically trying to store all the energy as uh, uh, latent heat. Uh, and, and you can do that, like, you know, because you need only to insulate that from the environment if you bring the energy level to that, to that level. If you insulate your installation very well, you can, you can keep that uh, energy level very high for, uh, for a long time. Uh, it's not volumetrically efficient, like, you know, uh, thermal energy, but in terms of a cost, is is uh, there's no doubt about it. It's right. much cheaper to do that than to try to restore electrons directly. Yeah, and, and the thermal energy, my understanding is that uh, it, it very, at these ones that go to very high temperature, you can actually recover a very high percent of the energy uh -huh. in and out of those things, right? Meaning that yeah. for, for a, a battery, for example, you know, once you store the electrons in and then pull it back out, you lose some of that just dissipation by heat, et cetera. But on some of the thermal storage, they're much more efficient. That's, that's correct. Uh, if you, you know, because what you are past, you know, these are heat exchangers basically. So you, you, if you leave, your, you can have this in your house, by the way, like you know, we just talk about solar collectors. Yeah. Like if you use like, you know, uh, paraffin or like you know, something that uh, uh, melts uh, a little below a uh, boiling point of water, uh, you, you, the, the problem is to find a substance that has good thermal conductivity uh, so that it can be uh, used efficiently uh, as a thermal, uh, as a heat exchanger, uh, but also holds like, the energy as uh, latent heat, uh, and, and there are materials for that. So the cost of those materials are not, is not uh, nearly as high as the cost of materials used in the electric chemical storage. Okay, and, and here's sort of a follow-on question of that. And that's that. So once you store the energy in thermal energy, how do you recover that? So the question is, do you use that to generate steam and power a turbine, or is there some other way that you recover that? Uh, that's exactly how you use that. So basically, you store this on uh, on large tanks that uh, when you pass, uh, like you know, uh, the steam through them, like you know, you would increase the enthalpy or the energy level of the steam uh, uh, high enough, like that you can actually run this through the turbine. So that's. Uh, uh, exactly what you do. There's different technologies like that. They use different uh, 
uh, working fluids. Uh, so you can store this in the oil. Uh, you can pass oil uh, through like a trough, for example, like then uh, the oil would be would exchange the energy with uh, a molten salt. Uh, and then you circulate the oil and you exchange that with a vapor in a different uh, heat exchanger. Uh, the details are not particularly important. I think that the most important thing is that you have a source of a high temperature that can be used mm -hmm. to elevate the energy of the vapor. Yeah, and then most of that, though, is turned back into electricity, at least in this country right now. Mm -hmm. Although, as you were pointing out, a fair amount of that can be used to warm water, right? Like in an individual yeah, in home, the, for industrial example. processes, like sometimes you need a high uh, temperature vapor that is not high enough to run a turbine, but you can actually use the vapor directly. So, like, that's... That's one application uh, that is done uh, uh, if you have a plant that has excess vapor that needs to be cooled off. And to close the cycle, one of the difficulties of uh, CSP in the past used to be that to close the cycle, you need to cool off the vapor now back to water. Yeah. And, uh, and that would require a lot of uh, water to evaporate in uh, evaporative uh, towers. Uh, but now there's quite a lot of uh, dry technology, uh, dry cooling technology. And in fact, Ivan, we just discussed that power plant. That power plant uh, does not use uh, cooling towers it's, uh, as uh, nuclear power plants right. do. Uh, so that uh, uh, plant uses uh, uh, fans, like no dry fans, okay. and it does not have excess uh, consumption of water for cooling. Okay. And so that, that's just an improvement in the technology over time, or was there something that, uh, that allows, is there something specific about that compared to a nuclear power plant that allows you to use that? Uh, yeah, one is, uh, is the, the temperature of the vapor cycle, like no makes uh, okay. a difference, but uh, it is really a recognition that uh, uh, water is a commodity, and uh, you typically you want to deploy these power plants in uh, deserts where water is not available. Right. Uh, so you don't want the water to be the bottleneck, so that right. there was a, a push to develop. If you look at the power plants, they are always uh, uh, sited in, uh, in locations where you have access right. to cold water. water. Yeah. yeah, always. Yeah. And now, uh, you know, in the United States, at least, we're no longer allowed to build power plants that have what's called once-through cooling, which means uh, you're, you're taking water from a river or from a lake you run it through to cool it and then pump it back out again. Here, uh, up in San Onofre at the nuclear power plant, they used to do that with the ocean water, and uh, that greatly impacts it. Yeah, because uh, a, a, a few degrees that you increase the temperature of the water uh, has uh, a, a very large uh, impact on the, on the uh, environment around it. Yep. Okay, so here's one, uh, and we'll see if Carlos can handle this one. Uh, could someone explain, well, if it's not Carlos, I don't know who, uh, how energy storage reduces utility transformer and line, and line load loading during peak hours, especially in a not-so-smart grid? So maybe a more generic way to put that is, can you explain how intermittent energy, uh, you know, gets onto the grid and, and how that impacts line load, et cetera? Uh, so in my group, like, we have a... a we are doing some uh, work with uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, and, uh, and it's interesting to see that because uh, there are some transformers, like in some feeders uh, within the San Diego Gas and Electric territory, that have a very high penetration of uh, solar energy. So, if you look at the load on transformers, and, and uh, traditionally, when uh, you had uh, fixed generation, uh, fossil fuel or nuclear generation, uh, most of the variability that needed to be balanced was on the demand side. So uh, this changes, of course, like when you have wind or solar generation uh, being a, a substantial uh, component of your, your portfolio. So here in San Diego, like, there are some uh, feeders that have very high solar penetration. And uh, when you look at what they are pulling from the grid, uh, you can totally see the signature of a solar generation there. Like, you know, if, if there are clouds, like, you know, the, the load is going up and down. Uh, 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 Two extremes, like you no, know, to, to almost like you know, uh, sometimes four or five times like you no, know, what the normal load is. Uh, of course, if you go to other areas where the solar penetration is very small, like you no, know, then the load it would be uh, very only due to the demand vari variability, which mm -hmm. is what is whoever is turning on and off the lights and uh, and other equipment and so on. So uh, I think your question was uh, how e uh, energy storage could do that. Uh, of course, like you know, if you store uh, energy, uh, if you have uh, that uh, inertial uh, component, uh, 
that you can actuate uh, and you can uh, demand from uh, when your solar, for example, goes down, you are actually changing the way that you are uh, tapping on the grid. Uh, so you need like some smart storage. You, you need something that I would tell, okay, tap now from, from the battery instead of uh, mm -hmm. you know, providing from the solar panel because, uh, and that's where like a forecasting <coughs> and, a, and a storage control uh, come into play. Uh, and, and that's really the definition of the smart grid, is having something that can react in real time uh, and uh, equalize uh, the load uh, with uh, the generation. And so right now, do you know how that's done? So suppose, you know, in, in California now, we generate a fair amount of our electricity as renewable, either from wind or solar. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly, you know, they're on lots of different rooftops everywhere. So what happens now when we're not producing enough uh, from solar? maybe clouds come by or maybe just demand is so high. How is that balanced right now? That's what these peaker plants do or, or what is this? Yeah, so it, there, there are several time scales that come into play here. Like, you know, the utilities have scheduling uh, on a well, day ahead basis. Uh, the, mm -hmm. And this goes all the way down to regulation and, uh, and dispatch at uh, five minute uh, intervals. Uh, and you have to have some idea of what's going to happen that's uh, a projection of, of demand use and, exactly. and sort of demand and, and so it's and forecasting of load okay. and forecasting of a, of the, okay. the variable generation. Okay. Uh, and with that and and due to a lot of a spatial variability, like because we now have a spatial averaging, if you have rooftops distributed over a very large uh, area, it's unlikely that uh, clouds would come and uh, instantly uh, cover okay. all the, the panels. Got it. Uh, so there's a combination of all of these things and, and it's a dynamic process and it's becoming substantially more dynamic and, <laughs> yeah. and that's what the, yeah, yeah. the smart grid is all about. Yeah, and and right now that's managed uh, in the United States by a grid operator, right? That, that's sort of... Several grid operators, yes. Okay, yeah. and then they then they integrate with each other. Uh, yes, they didn't use to integrate, like, and I think now the, there is interconnection uh, and uh, the, the, the direction to go is actually to, to be able to to buy and sell energy from uh, any part of the of the country, uh, my understanding is this is uh, not uh, uh, close to happening at this point. Uh, but uh, there are very large chunks of uh, of uh, territories that are under uh, independent system operators or or RTOs like that uh, that can do that job, uh, as if like you know, that section of the country is a small country. Okay, and then and, and then. Right now, if demand is too high, I notice that we will occasionally get emails on a hot day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when they when they predict it's going to be hot in the afternoon and tell us, turn down things in your lab. If you're not using these things, turn them off. What happens if people don't do that and you exceed and demand exceeds, you know, production? So the first thing that happens, of course, like, you know, uh, if you have a situation that you actually cross that, uh, that arrow bar, uh, that margin of error that exists, that you cannot actually activate a picker. Uh, plans to come online, uh, then like you, know, you cannot generate for everybody. You're gonna have to to turn off like you know, the grid somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and that's uh, uh, undesirable because you want to have high reliability on the grid. Right. Uh, wh what happens in, in general is that the people actually respond uh, much better than than expected. Uh, so when we get those warnings in our cellular mm -hmm. phones, like you know. Uh, the vast majority of people actually uh, respond very well to that, and uh, they try, try to turn off, and they respond like for a very good reason. Like you know, if they don't do like you know, the the cost of uh, each like you know kilowatt hour that they, they are spending is going to go up very fast. Okay. Uh, so there are picker plants that are ready to go online. And the problem with these plants is that uh, in general, the vast majority of them are highly pollutant, uh, and they are. Uh, Plants that are, are very costly to operate, right? Uh, so they, they make the money like out of a, those situations of those yeah. extreme situations, so they don't run the whole year. And Got so it. On. Which is part of the reason why the cost of energy is so much higher. Exactly. When you click those things on. Okay, here here's a very specific one, and I'm pretty certain Carlos can answer this one. It says, "Can you explain what factors are not considered in your clear sky irradiance model, and how it differs from global horizontal irradiance graph in your lecture?" All right, like if I can remember what was my lecture, like you know, <laughs> yeah, that, that's the problem now. You have to remember what was in there. So the clear sky irradiance model uh, uh, takes into consideration, uh, you know, the the all the important factors, but clouds. 
So clear sky like on takes in consideration uh, uh, aerosol content, like the aerosol optical depth, mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that uh, has a time scale uh, longer, much longer, like on, on the uh, range of between 30 minutes to several hours, typically several hours, like even a few days, uh, which is very different than the clouds. So we have a, a clear sky model where you 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 know like if there are no clouds in the way of the of the sun, you will have like on depth irradiance. So that's something that you can adjust uh, on an intraday basis, uh, and it works very well uh, because again the aerosols have uh, a longer time scale. So to, to, the short answer to your question is like a, the clear sky model has everything but the clouds. It happens to be that the clouds are the most important factor. <laughs> so uh, yeah. if uh, I would be very happy if my problem was only to forecast with the clear sky models, because we are very good at forecasting clear, clear sky. Uh, when the clouds come in, like no, that's uh, what the difficulty is. Uh, the clear sky model has is not related to global horizontal irradiance uh, uh, model. Uh, the global irradiance is what comes from the sky and the sun. So it's when you have a, 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 a view factor, like when you can see the whole hemisphere, uh, that's the, all the irradiance that's coming from. Uh, global irradiance can go higher than uh, the irradiance, uh, the extraterrestrial irradiance that hits the outside of the atmosphere because uh, you can have what's called like a sometimes cloud edge effect, or you can have like a cloud enhancement, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, there's a bouncing of the energy and the, the clouds actually uh, irradiate more than the solar constant, which is like you know, 1.3 uh, kilowatts per square meter. Uh, so all of this have to be accounted for, and uh, this happens actually on a very uh, regular basis in many locations, and, uh, and almost no place on Earth is, is exempt from having uh, cloud edge effects and uh, uh, peaks of uh, irradiance that can go to 1.6 kilowatts per meter square uh, due to the clouds. It depends on your sensor too, it depends on the aperture of your instrument and so on. So are, are the utilities using these predictive models now for the production from solar? Because it's getting big enough in California now that it certainly yeah. is impacting the grid enormously every day. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I uh, estimate that uh, all uh, uh, utilities and the ISOs have uh, some form of, uh, of uh, solar forecasting. Uh, and. Uh, the solar forecasting is being used uh, by solar generators. Like it's important to operate the plants, and uh, and and in general, like there is a handshake between the utility that has a model, the generator that has a model, and like they want to to be in the, on the same page. Mm -hmm. that, uh, this is uh, what we are predicting that we are going to generate, and so on. So if a generator starts producing very differently than what they are saying to the utility, like this causes a problem to the utility. So. There is an interest uh, from uh, from all the sides in this in this arrangement to to have forecasting. Okay. All right. Here's one which is a little different, off uh, you know, still storage uh, question. But is there a role for pumped storage for electricity storage? Example: pumping pumping of water uh, to higher elevation reservoir when there's excess power, and then hydroelectric generation when it is needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question, and and the problem with this uh, idea, like, and this is one of the uh, cheapest ways of uh, uh, storing energy. Uh, the problem is that you need the right geography to do that. Uh, so if you don't have like you know, a, a reservoir that uh, is uh, has a high enough uh, you know uh, gravitational potential to to store the energy, uh, you you don't have how to do it. Like, you know, that's uh, that's the, the problematic part of it. But there's no doubt about it that, uh, you know, you have to be a little bit creative about storage. Like the, the lowest cost storage that we have today are, again, depending on the geography, on the geology, or the place where you live, uh, you could store uh, compressed air in caves, like you know, it's a very low uh, uh, cost way of doing it. You could pump up, like, you know, uh, water uh, up uh, into a reservoir and so on. If you don't have the reservoir, if you don't have the geography, the problem changes substantially in terms of engineering. Because if you have to create the reservoir, uh, then like you know, the the low cost like uh, goes away. Uh, it's the same thing with uh, with uh, compressed air storage. If you have to have the tank uh, and you have to build a metal tank that will yep. store uh, compressed air, 
then uh, it's not that cheap anymore. Like so, that uh, the problem vanishes. But this is used in many different places. And again, going back to the question uh, about Brazil, uh, is one of the advantages of uh, of uh, having a very high uh, hydropower, like just like Canada has too, uh, is that you can play that. Uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, be a, if you have a lot of a sun, you are you are not using the hydropower that much. Mm -hmm. If you if the sun is not there, like if you have a, a, a overcast uh, environment, you can go back and uh, and and drive out of the reservoir and so on. Mm -hmm. and, I know, you can pump up too. And, and I know here in San Diego, uh, we have built one of these uh, within an existing reservoir. And uh, they've now hooked up a short-term storage plant to it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, so here's a related one that I wanted to get to about hydrogen and fuel cells, because this also has to do with energy storage again. Is there a perspective in storing energy in hydrogen than using it in a fuel cell electric vehicle, or I suppose in any fuel cell? Is this approach more or less economically beneficial than battery EVs? All right, so the problem of hydrogen as uh, fuel, like, and I think you are much more of an expert on this than I am, uh, still, like, I, is, is really the, the uh, mass uh, density of uh, energy. Uh, hydrogen is very light, so like, for you to store uh, any amount of uh, energy into hydrogen or to have any amount of uh, hydrogen, you need to store this at a very high pressure. Uh, and then the tank uh, ends up like weighing way more than than the fuel that you are uh, using. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Hydrogen is a great uh, fuel because it's uh, it's clean. Uh, but the problem for using the hydrogen as a fuel in a moving vehicle uh, is the how much uh, energy you can pack by volume uh, in the in hydrogen. Of course, this is not the same problem if you have a uh, stationary system where you are, you are using that. Uh, my understanding of uh, the hydrogen economy that actually never you know, developed completely was uh, that the problem is really in the cost of, uh, of generating the hydrogen. All the alternatives seem to be uh, a little bit more expensive than, uh, than things that we can actually do with the different technologies. Uh, and and it becomes and when you add that to the fact that like you know a gas as a fuel uh, is typically not volumetrically uh, viable, uh, then it, it takes this out of the of the equation. Uh, yeah. So in California, uh, we just spent uh, fifty million dollars to put in hydrogen fueling stations. Uh, obviously, when you burn hydrogen, when you oxidize it, you get water out, right? You know, it's it's H two O that that comes out of that. So in that sense, it's like very clean water, right? So in, in that sense, it's it's environmentally great, right? Because you're not making any CO two at all, right? Even with an electric vehicle, you're also not putting CO two out the tailpipe, but you're generating electricity someplace else. And if you're generating that electricity from burning uh, coal, you're actually worse off. Okay. Then, as Carlos pointed out, it's not just an infrastructure problem. So, so, there, so we're going to spend $50 million to put in hydrogen fueling stations with this idea that it's sort of the chicken or the egg problem. You know, you can't have hydrogen cars if you don't have hydrogen fueling stations, and people won't build hydrogen fueling stations if there aren't cars to come and buy the hydrogen from them. That economics doesn't work out. So the state stepped up and put money in, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. But that is only one of the infrastructure changes that, that have to be built. Um, you know, you have to have fueling stations. Today, we make our hydrogen from steam reformatting of methane. So we take a fossil fuel, and at high temperature, we can strip the hydrogen off that. Then we turn that carbon that's in there into CO2. So we're still creating CO2 to make hydrogen, again, just like an electric vehicle at a different site. But then the biggest disadvantage uh, that, that, that shows up is the low density of this. It's as low it's as equally as low as a lithium battery. So you can store about as much energy in compressed hydrogen as you can in a lithium battery, and there's infrastructure already in place for lithium batteries. So, so that's one of those tough things. It kind of works. Uh, the, the, the technology for fuel cells, those can be very efficient. Those can be very clean. So a good side on that, but infrastructure 
and the cost of building infrastructure is an enormous barrier to this. You know, to put that in perspective, the hydrocarbon fuels in this country have a 14 trillion, with a T, trillion dollar infrastructure. So that's all of the refineries, all of the, you know, the oil lines, all of the gas stations, all of the cars, that's $14 trillion. You simply are not going to replace that very quickly. So it's a challenge. Uh, we're trying some things in California, but it's very much in the experimental stage. Uh, we'll, we'll I, I think, sort of stay tuned and we'll see how that goes over the next couple of years. Okay. Um, here's one, and we kind of already answered that, but we'll just pop it up here just to make sure we close out any final thoughts on it. What are the economic issues of storage in handling the variables associated with renewables? It's the cost. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the, the issue is that we don't have a, a, a clean way of uh, store energy uh, that is very cheap. Uh, thermal energy storage in, in the concentrated solar power plants is uh, uh, much cheaper than, uh, than electron storage. So the bottleneck there, uh, but it still is expensive. So the bottleneck is, is just like, you know, economical. Yeah, I think, you know what, to, to be honest, we got so lucky. Uh, I mean, I don't know, lucky is the word, but, but, but you know, liquid hydrocarbon fuels are just, there, there's a reason we drive all of our cars and boats and airplanes on these things. They're, they're an amazing, uh, you know, for their volume and for their weight, they just store a huge amount and of energy. And it's tremendously convenient too. Like if you think about it, if you have a gas, uh, you know, if you if you are driving like a, something that is powered by gas, uh, you cannot just like you know, put the gas in a little bucket yeah. and, uh, and walk to your car. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the convenience of a liquid fuel is uh, is is the density. It's uh, you know, uh, a thousand times or many times, many thousands of times, like you know, higher. But uh, it, the convenience is difficult to beat. Like, uh, yeah. I think everybody has to recognize that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's like Howard says. If you can imagine, you you know, you if your car runs out of gas, you walk up to the gas station and get a little gallon container, which is barely a, a cubic foot. Walk that back down and put it in your car. And if you have a good, efficient you know engine nowadays, that one gallon can get you forty or fifty miles, pushing a three thousand pound vehicle for that far. And that that's pretty amazing when you think about it. So. That, that's simply really hard to duplicate. And, and it's actually one of the reasons that I, I think, you know, liquid fuels from algae or from sugar cane or from any other source that we can think of is still a really desirable thing. We don't have to replace the infrastructure we've got. And we have this fantastic, really high dense and very stable, by the way, right? Even though gas is obviously flammable, I don't think anybody worries that much carrying a gallon of gas, you know, down the road. This thing is not going to spontaneously explode, right? So, went back to that, uh, just before we move on on this, okay. like, it's very interesting. Like, uh, I've, I've witnessed, like, uh, in Brazil, the, the rise of uh, ethanol as a, mm -hmm. as a fuel, uh, which is started with a heavily subsidized uh, uh, program from the government. Uh, then it became uh, very profitable. Like you know, it became nobody wanted to have a gas car. Like you know, I, I went through this period where 97.5 percent of all the family cars in Brazil were powered by ethanol. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to add a little bit of a gasoline to the ethanol, but like, this is for different reasons. It's for Still people easy. not to drink the ethanol <laughs> to take it out of the pump. Like it was much <laughs> cheaper than, uh, than buying you like a, you know a vodka or something. Yeah, so. Uh, so when you, we go to that, and, and one interesting technology that came out of this were, was the full flex uh, engines. Mm -hmm. uh, ethanols, uh, ethanol cars like you know, have a higher compression rate, rate than, than the gasoline, uh, and this used to be a problem. Like you know, the, the mix had to be like you know, right for your car. Uh, but now in Brazil, like you know, I, I think you may have witnessed this when you went there in November. Like you know, if you if you drive a car, you you stop by the gas station, which is not a gas station, it's a gas and alcohol station in all of them. Uh, and you choose based on the price. You look like if the gas is too too expensive today, yep. uh, you put alcohol. And uh, yep. if you if the alcohol is too expensive, you put gas. Yep. So this adds some robustness to the market too, which is, I think yep. is very important. Yeah, and you have a little chart to figure this out, right? Because sometimes it's not so easy because the energy density of ethanol is only yeah. seventy percent of gasoline, but you went up with this in your mind, which is kind ah, of interesting. Like you know, you you actually make the, the mental calculation after because it's, okay. it's just a, a proportion, right? So, okay, all right, excellent. 
Okay, so here's one, and this says, hi, I'm a third year renewable energy student based in the UK. My questions for this week office hours is, what potential do you see for the re marine renewable industry? And what are the likely problems that the industry may face in the coming years? Uh, I think you were referring to tidal energy oh, yeah. and, uh, and uh, maybe wave uh, power. Yeah. Uh, I, so there's no doubt about it, like well, there's some energy to be harvested there. Uh, I don't think it's very clear what the impact of uh, uh, harvesting uh, wave energy uh, is like uh, to the coastal areas. Uh, uh, and as far as I know, like uh, they are very small uh, experimental uh, mm -hmm. power plants that they use uh, either of those uh, technologies. Uh, I, I think uh, this will be like you know, like you know, tidal is um, something that uh, is much more predictable than than uh, uh, wave energy. Like and, and I think there would be uh, some place for this in the future. Uh, I am not an expert in that area, so like I don't know what the growth uh, and what the potential growth is for that. Uh, I, I see at least in the next uh, 10, 20 years like, as a very small contribution to the overall portfolio of energy. But I may be wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, well, so, so uh, with, with tidal energy, that's very much geographic specific. So if you happen to be uh, in one of the lucky places where there's a big tidal flow, and as we pointed out before on other things, you cannot afford to go build complex brand new structures to capture this. You have to have some either naturally occurring, you know, the most famous one is Bay of Fundy up, up in Canada, right? Enormous tidal fluxes through there, very narrow bay. So there are places like that where specifically you have an opportunity to capture energy. Um, the problem is that what people have calculated is if you look at the entire ocean surface and the amount of energy and waves there, that's actually a pretty big number. The problem is you don't have any infrastructure to capture that. Then there's also a general rule, which actually comes from NASA, and it says if it costs you one, you know, one X to do something on land, then it costs you 10 X to do that in the ocean, and it costs you 100 X to do that in space. And this was, this was you know, borne out by the last 40 years of, of sea explorations and all the rest of the stuff you have to do. But if you look at that calculation, then it becomes pretty clear that anything that we can do on land is going to be much, much cheaper than what we can do in the ocean. If you have a windmill on land and it breaks, you drive up to it in a pickup truck and you get your ladder or your harness and you climb up and you fix it. If that same windmill breaks out someplace in the ocean, then you have to get in a boat, you have to go out there, that boat has to be anchored, there could be big waves at the time you're there. Those expenses just go up enormously. So even though there is a potential, uh, and you can look at the energy, and people have calculated how much energy in these things, to actually build the systems that are gonna capture those is really difficult to do. And again, it, it simply gets down to economics. What's the cheapest place I can build, right? And, and now, because solar and wind are, are getting so efficient and uh, it's so easy to put them up, you know, there are dozens of companies now here in San Diego that will come put these on my roof. Um, we, don't have, we don't have wind here, but I was up in Reno uh, earlier this year, and I see lots of houses that have little individual wind turbines on them. Uh, Reno, Reno gets a little bit more wind blown through there than San Diego does. We're, we're not a particularly windy place. But I think it's, it, it just can't, it, it gets down to economics. So it's not just the size of the resource. This is true in fossil fuel, by the way, right? Everybody loves to tell you how great, uh, you know, tar sands, look how big that, that potential reserve is. Shale, look how big that reserve is. You know, here in California, we have this enormous shale reserve, potential reserve, right? And, and a few years ago, people came out and they said 37 billion barrels of oil. And then a little more sober study was done this year and they said, well, the problem is it's fractured. It's not like the Bakken and the Eagleford shale. It turns out it's gonna be very difficult to get these out of California, very expensive. Gee, that number really isn't you know, 37 billion, that number is five or 600 million barrels. And so, so that's a big difference. What's that difference? It's not that the oil somehow disappeared someplace, it's the cost of going and getting it. So exactly the same thing applies in all of these. Economics trumps almost everything else. The best idea, you know, you know, the best theoretical idea on energy in the world 
if it's not backed up by really solid economics, just just doesn't work out. Okay. Um, let's see. We have time for maybe only one or two more questions here, so let's scan down them and see what we got. Um, well, here's one, and we'll see if maybe Carlos has some stats on this one, right? Do you have any stats on solar electricity generated by country? I believe that those countries that are way ahead in solar in the developed world are not those where the sun shines the most. So uh, I'll, I'll let Carlos comment on that, and maybe I'll throw in a, yeah, my two cents. That's correct. Uh, I think uh, not too long ago there was, uh, I, don't, I don't have very good statistics, but like, I think it's very easy for you to, to find this uh, if you... I think there's a Wikipedia uh, page like on solar utilization mm -hmm. per country and so on. Uh, but if, and, and this change is very fast, by the way. Uh, I have to say, like, if you don't look for a couple of years, like when you go back there, like you know, just a couple of new power plants would change, like on the statistics substantially. Uh, not too long ago, there was uh, some news that uh, uh, Germany uh, used in one particular day. I think it was a weekend. Uh, virtually all of the energy generated in the country came from solar. Uh, we have a few days here in California where, like you know, we are, we are getting to 30 percent, 40 percent of the energy is coming from solar. And uh, if you add that to the wind at night and so on, uh, if you integrate over the whole 24 hours, you can get, uh, in some particular days, like you can get uh, very high penetration of a of a solar. Uh, it's true that uh, Germany does not have a good uh, weather for solar. Like you know, the the climate is. Uh, uh, people normally refer this is, is roughly equivalent to Chicago, which is not known to be a, uh, a, a strong solar uh, place. Uh, there, there are very high potential for solar in the southwest of the uh, U.S. Uh, it's one of the best places in the world to, to generate uh, uh, solar energy. There are many other places, uh, you know, in uh, uh, northern Africa, like uh, the we just mentioned Brazil. Like, you know, the central plateau of Brazil is excellent. Uh, there's a place. Uh, in the uh, south uh, southwest of uh, of the state of Bahia in Brazil, that has a almost perfect uh, insulation uh, profile for insulation profile for for uh, PV uh, installations. Uh, it is true, like you know, it's not only the resource, uh, and it's the resource, uh, not the amount of uh, energy that is there available, but the variability of the resource. When the variability happens, if the variability happens, for example, during the summer. In a place where most of the load is coming from air conditioning, uh, then uh, that variability can be problematic for for solar. Uh, but on the other hand, for example, if you look at the central uh, central uh, valley in California, where you have a very large population, uh, you have an amazing amount of uh, irradiance during the summer. Uh, it's very hot in the central valley. Uh, and because it's very hot, like uh, people uh, tend to use air conditioning as a necessity. Uh, your load is uh, very strongly correlated to the solar uh, availability. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have all the ingredients like you know, for the economics to work uh, because you are going to generate solar at the highest uh, peak load when uh, people are actually using the air conditioning. Uh, and this, is, this coincides when the solar energy is available. So if you can have those different factors in the same equation, uh, then uh, uh, the, the system is, is right to, to develop. Uh, this is true, what you mentioned is true not only in terms of uh, different countries, uh, but it's also uh, true in terms of uh, you know, micro regions. Like, if you look at San Diego, for example, is the US capital of uh, uh, solar utilization. Uh, we don't have the best solar uh, profile, uh, in, not even in California, uh, but it's a combination of uh, many different socioeconomic factors that make San Diego uh, right to have uh, Steve uh, going to, uh, to install in his house like, you know, solar panels mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, so it's incentives, like in the case of Germany, uh, there was a very strong incentive over time. Uh, they are phasing out nuclear, like that was the option that was uh, uh, chosen. Uh, uh, in fact, many decades ago, there was quite a lot of uh, investment in solar in Germany and it's paying off now uh, by having uh, this large distributed generation. Almost all solar in Germany is distributed, is uh, flat PV, uh, different than what we can do in the, in the southwest of the US. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's exactly right. And the only thing I will add to that is uh, one of the last lectures uh, in this course will be on energy in Nepal. And uh, in, in that case where there is no central uh, electric grid, right, there, there is no on and off switch in any house. 
right, except maybe in Kathmandu in the main city, but once you get outside of that, and in those cases you think, oh, this is perfect for solar panels, right? There's, if you could put a solar panel in and you could get a little bit of light into people's house, this would allow them to read at night, it would allow them to have light when they cook, it would just allow to do so many wonderful things for them, they simply don't have the resources to purchase those and to, to, to even get them to those remote areas. They simply lack the funding to do it. And uh, that's something that would that uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about in another office hour. We'll have Alex on in here, who's got an NGO there to talk about that. But 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 social acceptance and who has the resources to buy these things, right? So obviously in Germany they do. Here in California we do, and in San Diego that's why we get them. It's a great idea, good for the environment, but you still got to be relatively rich to buy this stuff. Okay, we have time for just one last question, and I'm going to throw this one out to Carlos. And it says, "Is there any new technology being developed that will decrease the price of solar panels?" And 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 I will give you the opportunity to say just what is the coolest technology that you see sort of coming down the road on on solar energy and how we're going to utilize it. Yeah. So the the, the combination there is uh, is interesting. You can actually generate uh, energy at a low efficiency, very cheap, uh, with uh, with the very cheap solar panels. Uh, the, the price of the solar panels went down so fast that I think nobody could predict how fast like you know, it went down. If you go back 10 years like you know, and say that uh, today you can actually buy uh, a 100 watt panel under $100, uh, nobody would believe you. So like the, the, the cost went down substantially. But it's cost and efficiency. So you want to be able to bring down the cost of a 100 watt uh, panel uh, as uh, to a low uh, uh, value, but uh, keep like a uh, some efficiency. Uh, you can have like a much uh, lower cost uh, using thin films, like no, but mm -hmm. the efficiencies are much lower. Yeah. So the the question here is like, how can you actually uh, go beyond the three, four, five percent efficiency uh, with something that is so cheap that you could basically just paint anywhere and uh, hook up some electrodes and uh, and take the energy out of it? So these are the cool technologies that are coming yeah. up now. Maybe. Uh, a decade away, but uh, uh, to to make it into commercial products. But uh, I, I think it will become a reality very soon. Yeah, the really cool one that I just saw the other day are these uh, see-through solar panels. So what they're doing is they're absorbing uh, the infrared light. So as you look at them through the window, you still see visible light coming through. But infrared, which is most of the heat that comes into the house now, you're capturing that. So the house is cooler because it's effectively shaded, and then that energy is going to to you know, electricity. And I just thought, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, that's one thing that if you if you have your whole windows like you know with the solar panel, they are opaque. Like you know, you need like you no know, energy, like you know, to, to just right. illuminate your right. uh, inside. So uh, you you can play this architecturally. There's no no doubt about it. There are the beautiful technologies coming out uh, that I think will become uh, mainstream very soon. Okay. All right. That's all we have time for today. Uh, we're going to thank Carlos for coming over here and, and talking thank with you. us. And again, if, if you know later on you guys have some questions and want to email them uh, to me, I'll, I'll forward them on to our experts on solar stuff. Thanks very much for participating well, thank today. You. Thank you. Thanks a lot.